It's a great actors, great film. And uh, I think you, you, I hope, but I'm sure you will enjoy it. It's a very intelligent and honest film. Good evening. I'm Nicholas Elliott, and I'm very pleased to be here with director of photography Pierre Lhomme and director James Ivory. A lot of people ask me, well, why don't you, why don't you want to shoot the film with Tony Pierce Roberts, who just made a room with a view? And that would have been nice, but I think he was he had another job. But there was a bigger reason. Uh, I thought it would be interesting to have uh, Pierre, a Frenchman, uh, let loose on all those locations and, and rooms and, and uh, in, in England, which have been photographed and photographed and photographed forever. And I thought that he would give a new a new look, we get a new feeling from a foreign cameraman, and particularly a French cameraman, there would be something there that uh, you wouldn't get otherwise. And I think that's, that happened. I, I'm going from one pleasure to one pleasure, and this, and from one encounter to another encounter. So to meet Jim again was a great pleasure. And also, I knew that with him, we would have the best English actors as possible. And the, the pleasure of a cinematographer is very uh, uh, depending I mean, uh, on, the, on the actors. And I knew that I would be happy. I, I, I told Pierre, uh, I think, uh, let's let's do a film that's in cool colors. That was it. I mean, after Room with the View, which was Florence and Sun and and all the colors of Italy and so forth, and I, I wanted something. And also, there is uh, there is that about the story and, and the lives of the of the characters, which suggests coolness and the gray clouds of an uncertain weather of England and so forth. And I thought that a darker and cooler look would be good. You know, not all the directors are, uh, have a, an aesthetic point of view. And Jim has a, a very visual point of view. The relation with the script was so strong uh, I was discovering more than anybody else on the set, thanks to the actors also, but we had the scenario. Uh, uh, I was discovering a world which I really did not know. After the film, one of my cousins came to see me and said, I will tell you someone no one knows in my family. I am an homosexual. I said, I knew this guy, he was a cousin, I knew him for a long time. This is also part of the, uh, of the energy that you give when you shoot a film. I remember on this film, there was suddenly, around the space of the camera, a kind of mutiny. This was in England, a kind of mutiny amongst the camera assistants. Um, they, they weren't happy. And they, uh, it was the focus puller and the clapper boy and all the rest. And um, uh, they weren't happy. And suddenly, on the very day that we were, had planned the big scene where Morris and Clive have a fight, um, when Clive thinks that, or when Morris thinks that Clive and his sister are involved, they have a big fight. On that very day, which was a very difficult scene to do, uh, and the two actors were, you know, all prepared and had been preparing for Injury. it. Injury. The crew walked off the set, <laughs> just like that. And we had to wait around many hours until we got a substitute crew. And um, 
And then what did you say that I said about the king? <laughs> so I, I, I couldn't understand very well what was happening in the crew. You know, usually I have a crew and I have a very good relation with with my partners. Mm -hmm. And in England, I was the I was alone. And uh, this this uh, did happen in in, uh, in my crew, and I couldn't understand the reason why. <laughs> and, and James told me, but Pierre, you forgot that the French people killed their king. <laughs> I never forgot. <laughs> it's, it's true. I mean, he was a representative of the ancient enemy. And there he was, bossing them around. The sophisticated Frenchman. Uh, and this was just too much for these guys. And that was it. They walked off. We could never afford to have rehearsals. Of all of our films, there was only one that had really serious rehearsals, and that was Mr. and Mrs. Bridge. Uh, everybody was here in New York, uh, and we rented a place to have the rehearsals for uh, two weeks, and we had proper rehearsals. Now, those rehearsals don't have much to do with the way you actually shoot a film, because the rehearsals are not on the location. You don't know what kind of a room you're going to have with doors and windows and furniture and all the rest of it, and how the actors are going to move around. You don't know that until you go onto the set. So we just never had rehearsals. Sometimes we haven't even had read-throughs. On Remains of the Day, um, Emma Thompson was making a film until the day before she came, not the day before she started working, but the day before that. She was working on another film. We didn't even have a read-through. So that's just the way we worked. And, uh, but as I say, rehearsals, they're wonderful for getting, they're wonderful for going through the lines and deciding whether this line works or doesn't work or you want to add something or take something away. In that way, a rehearsal is good, but it's not good in terms of blocking a film or deciding how the scenes are going to be shot or anything like that. There's no, I mean, you can't just put all the people in a room and think it's anything like being on, being on a set. A few films, but the reason why I wanted to, to be part of a, a film crew uh, was the film of uh, Jean Vigo and the films of uh, Renoir and, uh, and many others. But those two guys are, are the men uh, at the strongest influence. I did not, when I went to school to learn about the film technique. I had no idea what I would be in a film crew. Uh, it came little by little. I was really uh, fascinated by the image and the light. But the main reason uh, was to be part of a film crew, to be a cinematographer for a scenario and a director. And really, this was what I wanted. And this is what I did. Uh, a few mistakes, maybe, but not so many. <laughs> and the greatest influence on me was Satyajit Ray. Because when I came to know him, I was making a documentary in India. And he had an enormous influence I, I mean, he, on, on our first feature, which was The Householder. I mean, he provided the cameraman, she wrote to Mitra, he provided most of his crew. He wasn't shooting a film at that time. He re-edited the film at the end. And all sorts of things. And the next film, uh, he composed the music, which was Shakespeare Walla. And he, he is the person, of all other directors, that has stayed with me the longest. And I see his influence, even today, or in the last film I made, I see it. There are moments, they would not be like that if it weren't for him. And they're not, it's not things that I'm copying him or even remembering, but I know that I have done them because of what I learned from him and his films and working with his crew. How much liberty did you take with the script? And in choosing such beautiful men, was that a, were the actors gay? Was that a statement of, of its own? I know beautiful people were in 
movies, but that whole aspect of kind of narcissistic uh, the correlation between you know the beautiful narcissistic type of homosexuality that Freud got into or whatever. You know, I want to know whether that was a deliberate choice or whether that's just a choice that movie makers make to have beautiful people and they have nothing to do with this particular theme. Well, you know, beautiful actors improve sort of mediocre books sometimes. <laughs> and I'm not saying Morris was a mediocre uh, novel, it wasn't, but of all of Forster's novels, it's the one that people have most criticism of. But if you if you get ter terrific uh, charmers to play the parts that seem rather flat as you read them in the novel, they bring them to life. So I don't know about narcissistic, but uh, that is a fact that happens with any kind of movie and any kind of adaptation, I think. Mm. And this is what... <clears throat> Ivory expects from a cinematographer is to make the people as uh, their best, best look and best behavior. Oh, well, particularly the women. No? Yeah, yeah, yes, I mean, the, the men. We are unfortunately right. living in a country with a great, a great, great um, film industry, but the, most cameramen do not know how to like the women. They just don't. I'm sorry. It's uh, a little complicated. Um, Forster said and wrote that he wanted to write a novel that had a, a, a homosexual love that had a happy ending. Nobody else ever had. It's just like there are no other films that ever that you see, wonderful as they may be, that seem to have a happy ending. People are always always punished or they die or whatever it is, and he wanted to have a happy ending. But the next thing is, well, what would that ending have been? Because he was ready to give up his job. He would really have had to go into a kind of hiding, in a way, uh, and live outside society. And um, so it wasn't, it, it wasn't ambiguous. Um, well, you, you didn't know what was going to happen to them, but at least at that moment they were happy.